When we hear about education reform, we don't typically think about subjects like music and arts or dance and theater, especially when it comes to the common core standards or national and state standards in education policy. But these should be important parts of education reform as well. Think back to when you were in grade school. Now think back to your music classes. Try and recall your experiences with music education. When you were in elementary school, did you learn to sing your ABCs or Twinkle Twinkle Little Star? When you were in middle or high school, did you learn about the great composers that we base so much of our curriculum off of, such as Bach or Mozart or Beethoven? One of the areas that we deeply examine here at TED is education. Since ancient times, it has been the pinnacle, the focal point of society. It is a necessity. It's what drives our progress. It's what keeps society moving forward. And it is a human right. The importance of music and the arts in education is unequivocal and has been advocated for here at TED and across several other platforms for years. But music education and education in general in the United States and perhaps globally faces a problem of stagnation. There's something very similar about the three composers I briefly mentioned. Did you catch it? It is that they are all of the Western European tradition, specifically prior to the 1900s and even more specifically to a select few classic European nations. Now, if we are to accept that one of the purposes of school is to prepare students to become members of society, then we must also accept that generally, based on its implementation, the purpose of music education is to prepare students to become members of society in the 1800s. <laughs> now, what if I suggested to you that your best funded school district or your best funded school doesn't necessarily provide the best education? Or that your better neighborhood school doesn't necessarily provide a better education because of its social circumstances. What if I told you that the way that the data is being analyzed to come to the conclusions about what makes a good or great school district is a farce? The data people typically use when quantifying or classifying schools as good or great is based in academic achievement, things like standardized test scores, state evaluations, passing rates, graduation rates, and so on. But how does the demographic of the school factor into that overall evaluation? Can a school with high academic achievement but with little diversity really be considered a great school or school district? I argue that it cannot, and I argue this because the school district itself, through its lack of diversity, not just among students, but among teachers and administrators as well, fails to offer necessary cultural interactions and experiences, something that I argue is a necessity in education. Now this data happens to be from one specific school district, so the idea is how can a school district be the comparatively best when it does not represent reality, when it does not represent the community or the communities that the district is supposed to serve and the global society we are supposed to be preparing our students to join. I believe we need to rethink our mentality and the optic that we take when we analyze the data that we have available to us when classifying schools and their districts as good or great or not. Now, often people will say travel is the best form of education. You can see the world. You can get your cultural interactions firsthand by going places and experiencing them. But not everybody has the ability to travel for education experiences. There are several socioeconomic factors that can lead to the time and money deprivation that is needed for this. Also, schools nationwide are not nearly as diverse as the communities they are intended to represent. This is particularly a problem for suburban public schools. Many schools are populated by families that have the ability or the privilege, even the luxury, to afford the real estate taxes that are used in funding public education. An unfortunate ramification being that what are often referred to as good or great schools also tend to be fiscally very privileged and therefore often not as diverse on several levels as the communities they are intended to serve. Now what I mean by this, for example, is 
Gentrification. Gentrification plays a role. Schools benefit from rising real estate markets and the subsequent rise in real estate taxes that are used in funding public education. Families that cannot afford this rise in real estate are forced to leave their neighborhoods, they're forced to leave their homes, and therefore children through actions learn that they are unable to access the same benefits the school is receiving. In theory, schools are equal and are supposed to provide an equal education, when in reality, many schools are divided and deprived of essential academic and education resources. The saying is, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. In this context, the affluent receive more access to academic resources, while those who suffer economic hardship receive less because of where they live and the taxes levied on their home. It's a hard topic to address in this field because it forces us to raise the mirror to our own situations, whether they be of economic privilege or of suffrage, but these are questions we must ask. These are observations we must tackle. Is public education funding fair? How does gentrification influence curriculum design and the selections that are being made in schools, and how does that affect the overall being of a school? Now, I may even be brash to ask this next question, but this is the nature of education, and so we cannot progress if we don't. Is the American education system systematically racist? Do schools suggest through curriculum design the superiority of some cultures over others? Do schools and their music programs, for example, suggest a cultural hierarchy in curriculum design? Is one culture musically superior to another, as the observation of its implementation would suggest? The answer to this last question is a resounding no. But our selections in the curriculum may suggest that very cultural hierarchy. We must remember that children not only learn from our words, but from the words we choose not to use. They learn not only from our actions, but from our inactions. If we continue to imply through curriculum design the superiority of some cultures over others, then we perpetuate racist mentalities and even behaviors, a consequence which is further perpetuated through how public schools are funded. And the continuation of both of these processes further perpetuates ignorance and intolerance in education, a history and reputation the United States long holds under the current system of education policy. Now the next question we must ask is, if no culture is superior to another, then why aren't all cultures equally represented for all subjects in all curricula? The world is much larger than these select few classic European nations that so many subjects base their curriculum on, and the curriculum must be expanded to adequately represent that. Teachers and educators must take a personal sense of responsibility to expand the curriculum to be more diverse and multicultural. We must take risks and explore areas outside of our comfort zone. But a personal sense of responsibility among educators is simply not enough. The current system of state-run education is systematically failing students in receiving that diverse, multicultural, holistic education. And it should therefore be their responsibility to provide access to the necessary funding so that teachers and educators can pursue professional learning for curriculum development. As Howard Gardner would argue in Frames of Mind, Know that does not readily or reliably translate into know-how. As people, we may recognize all of these concepts, but that does not mean that we are knowledgeable or capable of implementing the change that we desire. Also, not all schools nationwide have music and arts education, and the ones that do, there is no guarantee that the curriculum is multicultural. Cultural experiences through music and the arts are not federally mandated, and so teachers that do not want to do this, don't. It should therefore be the further responsibility of leaders in education to advocate and to guarantee that all children have access to a holistic music, arts, theater, dance education that is equal among their core subjects. 
Because to provide anything less, to not provide music in the arts, we should consider tantamount to malpractice. We should consider this theft of human potential. Because like I said before, education is a human right. But should simply providing an education be sufficient in meeting that right? All children should have access to a great education, and that should mean that it is holistic, diverse, multicultural, and includes equally music, arts, theater, dance among its core subjects. Now, while I advocate for not just a more multicultural education, but actually an absolute multicultural education, it's important to recognize another observation. The world is multicultural. <laughs> Our society, from the smallest fragment of community to the largest amalgamation of global society, is innately multicultural. Our move to a more multicultural education should be so swift and smooth that to use the term multicultural education should be considered redundant. If the world is multicultural, then multicultural education should be simply known as education not just in its definition, but in its implementation. Because music is a core subject. Art is a core subject. Physical education is a core subject. These are beliefs thousands of years old since the times of Plato and Aristotle. Aristotle. They have been reinforced by American education philosopher John Dewey in the early 1900s, and they're supported by Howard Gardner uh, the American psychologist. Yet, these seem to be beliefs that globally we still struggle to implement. Now, I bring up these philosophers because they, among others, in the education literature, continue to refer back to this ancient idea. It's the saying that says, Nusi gis and somati hi. It is the belief that the healthy mind and the healthy body keeps the soul of the person healthy and is the key to overall well being. It is a belief that in modern medicine and psychology continues to carry validity. If we can finally find a way to embody our already long and widely held belief of the power of music and the power of the arts and its positive effects on the soul, then we can finally begin to build the bridge of cultural awareness to peace and harmony in the world through music and through the arts. But is an absolute multicultural education really achievable? You know, there's a place in the world for pragmatists, and there's a place in the world for idealists. But there is no place for pragmatists if there are no idealists. If we want to achieve a world of peace and practicality, we must first understand what that world looks like ideally. And that pinnacle, that focal point, should be multicultural education, or rather just education. Thank you.